this section, we're going to revisit a topic that we covered in section 3.3 when we were studying the UDP protocol, we encountered the internet checksum. Remember, the internet checksum is used to detect bit level errors in datagrams by UDP. In this case, we're down at the link layer, so of course we're interested in frames. We're going to add to our earlier discussion in two important ways. First, by way of example, we're going to introduce this notion that bit level errors can not only be detected at the receiver, but they also be corrected and corrected without retransmissions. That's a pretty cool idea. Secondly, we're going to take a look at an error detection technique known as the cyclic redundancy check that's used in practice and is much more powerful than internet checksumming. So not too much to cover, so this should be short and sweet. Here's the error detection scenario that we studied earlier, now in a link layer context. The network layer will pass a datagram down to the link layer for transmission. The sending side link will then take the datagram, add some header fields to create a frame with D bits here, and then it's going to compute and append error detection and correction bits, EDC, here. The frame's then transmitted over a link that can introduce bit errors. The receiver then performs a check to see if the bit frames have been corrupted. We'll see how that's done in just a second. And if the frame passes the check, it'll extract the datagram, pass it up to the network layer. Otherwise, the frame will be dropped or perhaps a retransmission procedure will be initiated with AX and NAX, just as we studied in chapter three. What we want to focus on now is how this check is done. To understand that, we'll need to understand how these EDC bits are computed for here on the sender side. Perhaps the simplest case of error detection and correction that we can think of is simple parity checking, where a single parity bit is set to zero or one so that the total number of bits among the original D bits and this additional parity bit is even, in the case of even parity. In this example here, there's an odd number of parity bits in the first D bits, so the parity bit's set to one, so that now there's an even number of one bits among the D plus one bits. At the receiver side, the check is simple. The receiver simply determines whether or not there's an even number of one valued bits in the received data, including the parity bit. If there's an odd number of one valued bits, the receiver knows there's at least one bit error. If there's an even number of one valued bits, receiver knows, well, either there's no errors or possibly that there's an even number of errors. Well, that's the simple one-dimensional parity check. And we can generalize this to a two-dimensional parity check, laying the bits out on a grid like here and computing a parity bit for each row and for each column, and then have the receiver check both row and column parity. Well, we're using additional bits here, so you'd hope that this additional overhead would somehow bias better protection, and of course it does. You should convince yourself now that two-bit errors can always be detected, but the two-dimensional parity check buys us something more, something really special. In the case of a single-bit error, it also allows the receiver not only to detect that there's been a bit error, but also detect where that bit error occurred and correct it without retransmission. How cool is that? Let's take a look at an example of two-dimensional parity. Here's a case with our D bits again arranged into a grid. For the first row, we now compute the row parity bit to be one. For the second row, the parity bit is zero. For the third row, the parity bit's one. And we can compute column parity bits as well. Now let's suppose a bit's flipped in transmission, as in this example here. In this case, the receiver says, hey, there's a parity error in row two and there's a parity error in column two as well. And so it knows that the bit in row two, column two has been flipped. The error can be detected and corrected without retransmission. Well, this is just a simple example of what are called forward error correction techniques. They're used in DVDs and compact discs, in digital subscriber line, DSL, access networks, and in deep space communication where sender to receiver delays are very long. You'd much rather correct an error on receipt rather than having to request and wait for a retransmission. There's a whole field of study on error correcting codes. It's a great area to look at if you love math and math with very practical and very cool application. Well, we've covered the internet checksum already in section 3.3, and in some ways the checksum is very similar to parity. Instead of adding up bits though, we're adding up bytes with the internet checksum. 
but conceptually the behavior is the same. On the sender side, we simply add up the bytes, compute the checksum, and send the checksum along with the data being checksummed. The receiver action is also conceptually similar to what we've seen above. Well, we've said and seen that the internet checksum isn't particularly strong, and so it's not used, as far as I know, in any link layer protocols. Instead, a much more powerful technique is used in Ethernet and Wi-Fi. It's known as a cyclic redundancy check, CRC. So let's take a look at the cyclic redundancy check. Here again, we have D data bits that we want to protect. A CRC has what's known as a generator, G, which is a carefully chosen bit pattern of R plus one bits that's been standardized, agreed upon by all since both the sender and the receiver will need to use the same value of G. The CRC32 IEEE standard has a 32-bit generator. So we see here the D data bits that we want to send along with the R CRC bits. If we think about these D plus R bits, the given bits capital D and the CRC bits capital R, we compute the D plus R bits that we want to send first by left shifting the data bits to the left R positions and then adding in or XORing in the R CRC bits. And here's what the sender does. It's going to compute the R CRC bits such that this quantity here is exactly divisible by the agreed upon generator G. Since the receiver knows G, it's going to take the received bits, divide by G, and if there's a non-zero remainder, then it will be able to detect an error. CRCs are more powerful than the error detection techniques we've studied in that they can detect all bursts, that's all runs of consecutive bit errors of less than R plus one bits. That's pretty powerful. And it's because of these powerful properties that the CRC32, for example, is used in both Ethernet and Wi-Fi frames for error detection at the link layer. But we still have one important question to answer. How does the sender compute R? Well, we know that the sender wants to compute R such that the bit pattern sent is exactly divisible by G. Well, let's XOR R into each side of this equation, giving this which is really just a mathematical way of saying that if we divide this quantity here, d times two to the r, by g, r is the remainder. And this then gives us an algorithm for computing r. Let's look at an example. This is just a toy example with a small four bit generator g here. Here's d, and here's d left shifted by three. And now if we wanna follow our algorithm over here, we divide this quantity here by g, and here's an animation of doing that division, and the result that we get, the remainder, is the value of R that would be sent. That's all there is to it. Although in practice, again, the standard generators are a lot longer than four bits. Well, that wraps up our quick study of error detection and correction at the link layer. I hope you found the notion of forward error correction as neat as I did when I first learned about it. And I hope you also enjoyed learning about cyclic redundancy checks. It's a little bit dry, something that's really good to know about since as we've seen, CRC codes are widely used in practice.